Wait, where do you guys think you're headed? You missed last week's episode. I'm here to show you guys what you missed. We're coming back on the last time on Graveyard Cars. We just moved around the next car for disassembly. 1970 Cuda. This car belongs to Jim Root. Flipknot fans out there will recognize the name. I don't remember exactly, but I think I thought I was told that this is a numbers matching car. Okay. Like I say, I hope this situation is not what it's looking like. This is probably worst case scenario for us. Ooh. This station will remain on the air. On this episode. This is the car that was caught in that terrible garage fire. We have to start replacing sheet metal on it. I'm here to build cars, get the cars off the door. He's my Where? cousin. Where? Yeah. Let's start this thing. Bye. They're coming to get you, Barbara. In Springfield, Oregon, dead Mopar muscle cars are coming back to life. Restored by Mopar master Mark Warman. I'm a liar and a fat mouth. His daughter, Alyssa Rose. <laughs> okay. Why would you do that? His painter, Will Scott. You got one job. And his cousin, Dougie. You're the best. Welcome back to Graveyard Car. So the 1971 Hemi Cuda, this is the Phoenix Cuda. This is the car that we featured a couple seasons ago and some last season that was caught in that terrible garage fire, the one that almost took the life of its owner, Wendell. My name is Wendell Mulberg. I was involved in a structure explosion and fire in 1999, and my 71 Hemi Cuda was in the fire and it was destroyed and I wrapped it up and I kept it protected for the last 18 years. We contacted Graveyard Cars and Mark and they're gonna restore my car back to its original condition. I used to work in a wrecking yard and I've seen the cars come in that's been hit and all everything and usually there's stuff that's not in too bad of shape. This one, I mean, when it goes all the way to your frame structures warped and you've got panels warped, you know it was in a hot fire. Once the car got here and it made its way through the queue, the first thing we did was disassemble it down to the raw shell. I was curious to know exactly what kind of condition the quarter panels, wheelhouses, trunk floor, main floor, those kind of things were in. When it came back from the dipper, it turned out that the bottom of the car, other than the trunk floor, like the main floor and the step well and the under seat pan, were beautiful. The firewall, beautiful. Aprons, beautiful. Frame rails, front and rear, beautiful. These are all the structural components of the car. So that was a big relief. That meant we had to start replacing sheet metal on it. So I got together with George. We talked about exactly what panels are going to be replaced and what ones are going to be repaired. When we first got the car back from the dipper, we first started by cutting off all the bad metal that we could not reuse. And then we cut the frame structure out very carefully with Mark. And we slowly straightened it out, replaced parts that we could replace with from other cars. And then we welded it back in slowly. It, it was a big challenge. Doug and I are getting ready to disassemble the Dana 60 rear axle out of our 1971 Hemi Cuda. So the first thing we're gonna do is take the leaf springs off of the axle just because it, number one, <laughs> first and foremost, if you look. Over here? Well, either side, Doug, it's fine. Yeah, sure. Well, look these look a lot here. nicer, look at these. Yeah, they're burned too. <laughs> it was all in a fire. <laughs> I was just gonna show them that these little pieces of plastic, melted plastic here, and this squeezing out, or what's left of the liners that go in the leaf spring. We put brand new liners in when we restore them. Doug's side, which he's really proud of, would like to show you just how terrible it is. Look at this. Well, they're melted. They're melted like the other side, but they're even more melted. It probably was closer to the fire, huh? Uh-huh. Anyway, because these have been in a fire, I don't trust their tinsel strength, their spring strength. I'm gonna put a replica set of springs on it, which is fine. The ones that I get from springs and things are identical twins. The only difference, the ones that I get new in these are the lower leaf spring. It doesn't have the part number in it like this one does right here. So Tony makes the lower leaf spring brand ah, new. Ah, we'll you were paying attention. Production leaf springs and we'll have what looks to be NOS leaf spring for it. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Okay, <clears throat> let's get the spring down. There's a bit of an anomaly on this one that even Tony doesn't have the answer right now to. And it is this. Of all the Dana 60s, of all the rear ends, of all the cars, hundreds over the years, we've never seen one 
featuring 11 inch brakes on a 410 Dana axle. The number 026 is the last three digits of the assembly number. When you look 026 up, which is also on his broadcast sheet, by the way, matching fine, says you get 10 inch drums. According to the parts book, according to Chrysler, according to the options manuals, if you got a 4.10 gear ratio, Dana 60, in an E-body in 1970 and 71, the only years it was available, you mandatory got disc brakes in the front. You also mandatory got 10 inch rear drums. The drums on the axle were 10 inch with disc brakes in the front. Wendell's car, the Phoenix Cuda, is a real live Super Track Pack 410 Dana with power disc brakes in the front, mandatory remember, but it has 11 inch drums on it. At a glance, how I can tell this is an 11 inch without even taking a tape measure to it, you see these little cooling fins here? Yes. You see how this drum doesn't have those? It's real smooth. This is a 10 inch drum. So at a glance, when you go across our axle rack out there and you see 100 rear ends, you can tell at a glance which ones have 11 inch, which ones have 10 inch. Nowhere in the book does it say anything about that. Tony told me that when he was talking to Steve Giuliano, who had a couple of Survivor cars, he also had 11-inch drums on there. But nowhere can we find where you could have selected 11-inch drums with the power disc brakes in the front and a 410 ratio. If so, here's the yeah, tag. Yeah, the car got undercoated. It happened. Yeah. So this is the what they call the axle ratio tag 410, and this upper number means that the ring gear is 41 teeth and the pinion gear is 10 teeth. And that's what gives you a 410 ratio. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and crack the cover loose. Go more. ahead, go ahead. You ready for oil? Yeah, there okay, it goes. Okay, here we go. Oh, look at that. Isn't that great? It looks good, actually. It does. It looks amazingly good. <laughs> Nice. Okay. Man, look how thin these brake shoes are. Pretty rusty, huh? Yeah. Well, the, all the paint, everything got burned off of it. You have an axle puller. Whoa, look at that. It just came right out, Mark. So with the axle completely disassembled now, we're going to have Eli do a steam clean on it, blow all the garbage that's on the outside of that housing off of it, including the, the center section, so that we can move it over to the media blast cabinet and start media blasting it. Once that's done, we'll can paint it. It can come back over for assembly and finish Wendell's 20-year dream of bringing that CUDA back to life. The Phoenix Cuda is a 1971 Hemi Cuda that was burned beyond recognition in a fire. And uh, most of the metal to the car was just completely caved in from the fire and everything that happened after the fire. And uh, so we're gonna reconstruct this car. I am pretty excited to rebuild this engine because uh, it, it looks like a new engine now. I'll be using a lot of the high-tack Permatex uh, gasket sealant on this because uh, most of the gaskets that we use on the engine can tear pretty easily. The cork gaskets in the valve cover can snap in half. The paper gaskets, if, if installed improperly, they can tear a rip, or if you don't get it in place, a bolt can poke a hole through it and ruin your gasket. So uh, yeah, high tack holds it in place really well until you bolt them together. these engines together can be a little challenging. Sometimes threads aren't completely cleaned out inside, so sometimes I have to uh, kind of thread chase some of the holes and clean them out again to make sure the bolts go in all the way. We don't want the bolts to strip out or get galled when they go in. So I think when we're done with this engine and this car, I think Wendell is going to be one really happy customer.
When this thing comes back from the machine shop and everything is cleaned and resurfaced and new pistons, new bearings, uh, it's very rewarding to put these things back together again and see a really, really nice looking engine when you're done. On the head gaskets, you have a perfectly flat milled surface and you don't use any sealer in there because the head bolts will hold the head gasket in place. Okay, so when I get the engine assembled, I'm gonna go ahead and send it down to Will for some beautiful Hemi Orange paint. And when Will gets this engine painted, it's gonna look awesome. And uh, once it gets back from Will, I'm gonna go ahead and bolt the automatic transmission back on this thing and we'll have it ready to go into the car. What I'm working on is an upper control arm off the Phoenix Cuda. It's pretty badly rusted and uh, heat burned from the fire that it was in. And I've also got the rear breather tube off the back of the 426 Hemi engine from the Phoenix as well. And uh, it doesn't even look restorable. It's burned pretty badly and a lot of rust on this. So uh, we're gonna try the water blasting machine and see how it works on these parts. We used to sandblast all of our parts with a dry sand media blasting process. When we were done with it, it had a kind of a rough finish and we're really excited about the water for a more thorough cleaning all the way through. After we get the upper control arm water blasted off really good, we're just gonna dry it, clean it. We'll put a satin clear finish on it and then it's gonna be ready for build out on the front of the Phoenix Cuda. So when we moved into this building, we put in two brand new seven and a half horsepower rotary compressors. I worked with the company that put them in to make sure that we had the proper amount of air supply, both cubic feet per minute and as far as air pressure itself goes. So what they recommended we do when the compressors are in to plumb off of them, we ran a one and a half inch main line completely around the inside of the building mechanic shop, upstairs, downstairs, up in the parts room. It's just a great big 360. Then off of that 360, there are drop downs. Every 15, 20 feet, there's a drop down with a plug in on it. Some have the real craft hose reels on it. Other ones just have the nipples to be able to plug an airline into, which is a fantastic system. But we now have five body men, a painter and two helpers. Plus we have the mechanic shop. So what's happening is we're running low on air. So that's all this is, is an addition, a, a constant growth pattern for graveyard cars to make sure that the quality and the speed of what we're doing is never compromised. So Mark and I got the disassembly of the Phoenix Cuda rear end done. Got it all taken apart, came apart really nicely. So we've got it all disassembled. We've sent the housing out to Eli. Eli is going to pressure wash it, steam clean it, and he'll use a lot of degreaser on it. He'll get it cleaned up really good. And as soon as Eli gets all that done, we're gonna send it down to Will for paint. And when it comes back, uh, should be looking really good. The reason we're gonna have to work so hard on this rear end is because this was in a fire. And this thing has got some melted plastic on it. It's got a lot of rust from sitting for many, many years. It also has some grease on it still from some things that have leaked on it. So Eli will have a pretty good job ahead of him to clean this thing up. My son Eli's been working with me and Mark. What Eli's doing is to restore the parts and have them ready for us for reassembly. And he's doing a really good job. Eli's got the rear end steam cleaned real nicely. And uh, he's got all the grease off. So when the rear end comes back from paint, I'm gonna go ahead and finish detailing all the parts, or Eli will. We'll get those all ready for reassembly, and then I'm gonna put the Phoenix rear end back together. The 1970 Dodge Challenger RT convertible is one of the most collectible cars on the planet today. The one on my right is a 446 pack four speed, one of only 61 built. The one on my left is a 383 Magnum automatic and they built 516 of those in a convertible. True or false, you could not get the legendary 426 Hemi in a convertible Challenger in 1970. If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break. We'll find out together. All right, folks, how did you do on that one? 
was the legendary 426 Hemi, putting out 425 horsepower, ever available from the factory in a Dodge Challenger RT in 1970. If you guessed yes, wait for it, you would be right. Not real right, because they only built nine of them. But yes, it was available in the 1970 Dodge Challenger RT convertible. Of the nine that they made, five of them were four speeds and four of them were automatics. Again, making this car one of the most collectible cars in the world today. Okay, so one of the things that we have to deal with here, and, and I did even in the collision business, are damaged parts. Sheet metal typically are the most vulnerable to getting damaged. They're big, they're flimsy, it's hard to support them unless you put them in a big crate. So in the case of our roof skin from Auto Metal Direct, we just unboxed it and it turned out that it had gotten folded almost in half, not quite, maybe by a third, right at the back half of it. That means that the rear window opening and the sail panels aren't right. There's no way I can put that on the car. I can't massage it after it's in place. I have to get it roughed out. That's what we're doing. We roll that roof up to where we can get the pinch weld exactly down on a flat plane, works like a dolly, and we go through and we metal shrink it. Tap, 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 straighten, 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 tap, tap, tap. You continue to do that until you get that nice opening at the back window. Then you move around shape your quarter sail panel area and stress relieve the areas where it might have buckled. There's no doubt that the metal is stretched and I can shrink it. I can't do all of it while it's off the car. I can get it roughed out, that's what we're doing now. Get it to a point where it'll go down on the car, we can put it in traction, clamp everything down, then I can metal finish it off. So we had no trouble getting the roof on there. Uh, the straighten out, the pre-straighten we had to do is perfect. I've done so many of these, I, I know the shape, I know all that stuff, which sounds arrogant and I would hate to sound arrogant, but. Bottom line is, that thing went on beautiful, so it allowed the guys to be able to weld it up. So they're just now finishing up all the grinding, all the welding. That'll be the last thing. That's the last piece that goes on that car. That'll be the end of the metal work. Okay, so it's been a long time since we tore down the Phoenix engine. So now we've got the engine back together, fully restored, and we've got a transmission restored for our 71 Phoenix Cuda. So we're gonna bolt the transmission back to the engine, put it on the installation cart, and uh, await the installation. So, here we go. Look at that. All right. That was a nice lineup. This is a nice looking engine on the inside. Yeah, this thing should really run good again. Okay, Eli, tighten your side. What is a Phoenix? Uh, a city in Arizona? Okay, enlighten me, Eli. What is a Phoenix? A bird that has burnt down and risen from the ashes. That's my boy. Thank you. That would be Phoenix. Okay. A phoenix, yeah. I'll have to study that a little more when I'm not busy working all the time. Okay, what we're doing right now is bolting the flex plate to the torque converter in the transmission. I've got Eli underneath there, putting the bolts in place, and then I'm gonna rotate the engine to line up each hole, four of them, and we'll final torque them after I get all the bolts in place in the converter. Ready, Eli? Go ahead and rotate. Eli, have I told you any bad jokes? Not today. <laughs> Not today. <laughs> Go ahead and rotate. I'm slacking. Do people find my jokes funny? No. More. More? Quite a bit, yeah. There's good. Okay. You know, there was a time when I had some funny jokes, a long time ago, and so I really don't like telling jokes anymore because I don't know any funny ones anymore. I only know one joke. Eli, did I tell you about the two fish in a tank? No. No? No, you have not. Okay, so there's two fish in a tank, right? Okay. And one says to the other, do you know how to drive this thing? <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Thanks. 
Uh, I've forgotten all my, my good jokes. Okay, so we got our transmission bolted onto the Phoenix engine. We're gonna roll it forward, set it down on its K-member, and this cart ready for installation. So, uh, here we go. All clear? Clear. It's a big engine, huh? Lower yeah. her down a little bit. Okay. There we are. So now that Eli and I have the engine and transmission married together, the next step will be to restore the rear end and get it ready for the Phoenix Cuda. Hey ghouls, Mark here. I wanted to take a minute just to do a quick Mopar teaching moment. And this is a fun one because it has to do with the Dodge Super B. So in the late 60s, Dodge introduced their idea for the muscle cars as a group calling them the Scat Pack. When they did, they came out with this cool little B called the Scat Pack B. That's an original B. This is a reproduction B from our friends at ECS. I'm going to put it on next to the other one, which is right here. Put it on right here. And let's compare them. Well, here you can see the original 50-year-old Scat Pack B on this quarter glass and the brand new one from our friends at ECS. Same color, same hue, same shading, same features all the way around. There's a reason we select the vendors we do. We do OEM restorations, OE restorations. So if you're doing an OE restoration and you'd like to compete, whether it's a national level or a local level, just make sure you buy the right parts from the right vendors. So where we are today, the car has been through metal. George and I have been working collectively on it up to about three weeks ago when I cut him loose to do all the welding. And so our new protocol, part of our standard operating procedures to make sure the quality is there, is that once they are done in the metal shop and they think that it's ready to have the mud work done, I have to sign off on it. And so I'm getting ready to go get George, bring him down here. We have it lit really nicely. We're gonna move it around, rotate it side to side. I need to check for the things that I can't do later after the mud work's done. If there's some things we got to do, we need to do them now. All right, George, let's go ahead and rotate this up. We'll just go as close to vertical as possible with it. Well, Mark's been working really close with me on the car. And a couple weeks ago, he cut me loose on my own to do the welding and the last of the fitting. So finally, he's coming back. And he's going to see everything that I've done. I'm kind of excited, but really nervous. Pretty good right there. Good. Right in there. Great. So I'm just looking to see is there any grinding left? I mean, these are all new, these are all original panels, so the only grinding you might have would be on the trunk area. I think we got most of the grinding. Great. The main thing I'm focused on right now in this final sign off of the metalwork is to be sure that we can dial in all of the body panels, the bolt on body panels, and have good lines. In the past, we've made the mistake of saying, well, I think we can adjust the fender and get the gap between the, the door and the fender, only to find out that the fender was all the way maxed out and it should have been fit right before it actually went into the mudroom. Okay, frame rails, these are his originals. The holes are nice too. A lot of times these holes are caved in. This one has a little dent right here, so I wanna fix that dent. So I'm just gonna put a red circle around it. I was surprised at how nice that firewall was. I mean, look where it meets the floor, how nice all the original spot welds are. Just amazing. That is beautiful. Amazing that the fire didn't cause that. Yeah. A good idea. Is this a little reminder? So from the firewall forward on the bottom of the car, it looks great. Torque boxes are nice shape. Rails still just need to be cleaned up. This all looks great. Torsion bar cross member, nice. Factory spot welds. So when we were working on the frame structure, I mean, there was certain stuff we just couldn't replace from another car. Just before this goes over there, have uh, Steve go through and just shine this thing up and have Will put some primer on it so it can't rust. Okay, no problem. Pinion snubber in place. Step well, under seat cam, beautiful. Rear frame rails, beautiful. God, I cannot believe how nice they are. Oh, okay, I want, I'm gonna put some marks on these. I need these fixed. Those I just want to use like a Morgan knocker and bring those things out so those holes are nice and plumb. We can do it now or we can do it right before we undercoat it. I don't really care. Okay. The bottom of the car had some 
dents in the frame rails from just previous moving it around over the years. We're gonna have him fix that, pull those out, straighten them. We want it to look really nice from front to back. Nice spot welds, good work on that. That looks absolutely factory. Go ahead and clean this up just a little bit like with a roll off right through here. Let's clean up these right here. I want you to go ahead and weld these up, these little cuts right here, I'll circle them. And those little cuts right there, just do a buzz, buzz, buzz grind and don't get into the floor pan. Just, I mean, we could use a filler on it, but it's a frame rail and just so we can say we did. Okay, no problem. Wheelhouse looks very nice. Nice factory spot welds where the wheelhouse meets the quarter panel. I want to make sure that we uh, media blast this rocker. See all the pitting? Mm -hmm. Before this goes over there to the mud guys, let's make sure that gets blasted really nice. That can be done outside, but all of this area here. Oh, make sure it's done. Both sides, okay? I mean, look at the rear cross member. Clean these welds up right through here. Just clean them up and finish them off. It gets a seam seal along there, so it's fine. Trunk floor extensions, really nice. Everything fits good. Did you already pre-fit the rear balance? Yes. It's part of the assembly as we get ready to put the quarters on, we fit the rear balance and the trunk to make sure everything fits right. That looks absolutely great. Thank you. Okay, so I think at that point, we can go ahead and rotate it down and take a look at the quarters, trunk floor, inner and outer wheelhouse, all those perspectives from the top. Okay. okay. The major thing that makes me the most nervous, Mark's very crucial. He will go over the cars with a fine tooth comb. I mean, I don't want to mess up or make a mistake because I don't want to hear the backlash or feel it. Hey everybody, Mark Warman here with Graveyard Cars. I've got a teaching tech here for you on the tie rod end sleeve assembly. This is an original part. This is a tie rod. You'll notice that it has a hex castle nut. That's six, one, two, three, four, five, six. This will work, but it's not correct. Originally, the Mopars used a tri-castle nut. One, two, three. So you, it's okay to use a later model tie rod, but make sure when you do it, you use the correct castle nut on it. One of these has a left-hand thread. One of them has a right-hand thread. This threads in like this. I always like to put a little bit of grease on there. I keep it down there because I do not want grease all over my countertop. So now I can just slide that in there, run it in, take the other one, put a little dab of grease on it. Boom, boom, boom. This is a left-hand thread. The reason there's a left-hand thread right here is so that you can adjust it. The only thing we want to do before we put that tie rod end on there is we want to put our clamps on. There's one, and here's the other. This goes on here. Again, left-hand thread goes the other direction from what you thought it would. This gets mounted into the car. You grab this sleeve and you turn it. These would be fixed and it would make your tire go in and out, in and out. That's the way you do an OEM restoration on a tie rod sleeve assembly. Oh, there's a bridge, Mom. Doesn't look that safe to me. There's only one way to find out. Hey, where are you going? Well, the bridge might not hold all of our weight. Wait, how come I have to drive across? Because I was smart enough to get out first. Thanks a lot, Mom. Hey, Mom, I made it. Good, good. Now come back and get your mother. One of the things that I wanted to make sure of on these cars is any panels that are going on the car, such as quarter panels, Dutchman panel, inner rockers, outer rocker, wheelhouses, things like that, they get completely painted, even though they never were painted at the factory. It just is going to help with rusting. We don't want the car to rust down the road. As we look around this car, you're going to see a lot of the B5 Blue original color now in a jam form. Jamming meaning you'll see the floor the under seat pan, the step well, the trunk floor, the wheelhouses, the insides of the quarters, because we replaced them, we had to replace the sound deadener and then paint them. 
So that's why you'll see a lot of the B5 blue paint on it. Hands on the other, okay. So under the hood is absolutely beautiful. There, that doesn't need anything except sand it out and jam work done, okay? Okay. I've checked it off for all the holes. There are no extra holes that shouldn't be there. And the holes that should be there still look like they'll take a bolt in them, so we don't need to weld those up. So it looks to me like with some adjustment on the striker, the door needs to come out a little bit more to be able to line this plane up and this plane up. Once those two are lined up, this is gonna be a little bit low right in here. But I think we're okay to use a little bit of filler, like a, you know, just a, a good pass of filler to make a perfect line right there. Okay, no problem. Bottom of the door is really nice fit. Good job on that. Thank you. So this is the tricky part. The, the fenders from Auto Metal Direct are great, but they always need a little bit of tweaking, and this is usually where and it has to be done before it goes over there. See how close our gap is here? This is a nice gap right here, but it starts getting wider right here. That's the fender. So what we're gonna end up having to do is move the fender back and close this gap up a little bit. And my suspicion is once you do that, this is gonna be too close, so we may need to clean the end of that rocker up to give us a nicer line okay. and make that a, a perfect line. You don't have a lot of room to grind there, but you have a little bit. So if that fender came back into it, I think you'd be fine. Otherwise, that's it. I don't think you're gonna have to do any cutting and welding. Okay, this is a nice repair right here. The factory had about the same exact thing. Of course, they use lead. We're gonna use Duraglass. It'll be fine or panel bond, either one. Yep. Quarters fit the wheelhouse nicely. Looking down the side, I've got nice, nice plane going down there. So I'm not seeing a door out here and a fender in here and the fender bowling back out here. So that's definitely the kind of thing that we can move forward with uh, filler and smoothing it out. Side marker area is great. I saw the other day you had pre-fit that. A lot of times those don't fit. That looks really good. How you doing, Georgie? Good, good, good. Aren't you glad you're not my whipping post today? Oh, yes. They call him Curious George. Right? No. So anytime the camera's on and me and Mark's going over something, somewhere in it, he's gonna get a little bit crazy, start calling me Curious or making fun of my name or just poking fun at me. What do your friends call you? George. George? Yep. But your last name's Mick George. It's Mick George. Oh, Mick, Mick, Mick George. So like Mick George, Mick Jagger, Mick Taylor, right? But I'm here for one reason, one reason only. I'm here to build cars, get the cars out the door. Let's make some money. All right, let's take a look at these trunk lines. We don't have the springs on yet. I do want you to put the springs in from now on before they go over to metal. Okay, no. Over problem. to mud, I mean, sorry. So we ended up going with an auto metal direct deck lid, which is great. He's a non-spoiler car, that's fine. Please find the original correct bolts that hold that in place, the deck lid to the hinge. And well get do. them replaced. They're not a gold cadmium that I know of. Okay, let me just check our gaps. Okay, so I hold this in. If it had the body bumpers in it, bring it up to the height for me. So the only thing I'm gonna wanna do is that side of the hinge you'll need to go up just a little bit. Okay. And I think when you bring that up, it's gonna take care of this arc in the middle. If not, you can give this a little tweak and match this arc to the arc of the Dutchman panel. The great thing about going over these cars with Mark is that we are catching any possible mistakes or anything that we missed. So by Mark going over everything, it just cuts that last little chances of any mistakes out. Last thing I want this car to do is go to a car show where every keyboard commando wannabe knows more than I'll ever know and I'm rubbish and they're the best, whatever. They're gonna crawl up its butt with a microscope and they're gonna be looking. Oh, they're looking. They got their feeler gauge, they got their magnet, anything they can do, because they want they want to take down the ice tray, the ice pick, the ice man, right? Ice shavings, ice cream. I got a whole bunch of them. I can go on. I'm having a whole shirt made, like those bands that go on tour where they just have all the different destinations like that. I'm having one of those written out with all my ice names on it. How about ice? How about not ice? Okay, because that's a bad that sounds you can't say that, you have to bleep that. The car on my left is a 1970 Dodge Challenger convertible. It features a 383 Magnum, a convertible top, and an automatic transmission. It also is a very famous movie car. In 1994, this car was on the scene and on the screen. What was the name of the movie? Was it True Lies, Natural Born Killers, Pulp Fiction? See how you did on that one after the break.
We're my number one cousin. No cousin Dougie. Ha <laughs> ha. Cousin Dougie. And hello, Dougie. Hi, Mark. What you doing up there on that machine? Getting ready to change some light bulbs. None of them are burned out. Yeah, I know. <laughs> hey, you know Rapid Roy the stock car boy? No. Nope. Yeah, too much to believe. He's always got an extra pack of cigarettes rolled up in his t-shirt sleeve. Yeah, he's got a tattoo on his arm that says, baby. Got another one that just says, hey. But every Sunday afternoon, he's a dirt track demon in a 57 Chevrolet. Now, you want to go crazy? You want to play psycho? You want to do one flew over the cuckoo's nest? Adios. Replace some bulbs that aren't bad. Huh. These are all good. Huh. Okay, folks, how did you do on that one? Our 1970 Dodge Challenger RT Convertible 383 Automatic, one of only 516 built, was in a famous movie in 1994. If you guessed Pulp Fiction, well, you'd be wrong. The actual answer is Natural Born Killers, 1994, Woody Harrelson, Juliette Lewis, Robert Downey Jr. And for those of you who did guess wrong on Pulp Fiction, don't feel too bad because I did kind of pull a fast one on you. Quentin Tarantino wrote the script for Natural Born Killers. So you might get like a half a point, half right, something like that. Anyway, now you know. I don't take anything for granted. Even though we do all the steps I've told you before, things move, things change. Setting that glass in there absolutely is the best payoff for all the hours, for all the stress, for all the, honestly, you can't charge enough money. You can't charge a client enough money to spend the time that we spend making sure these cars are right. Got the same reveal. In fact, we got lucky and it just dropped into the same reveal. From a metal standpoint, that looks really good. Thank you. We had a car a while back. Remember the red Cuda? Yeah. The that was a numbers matching 340 car. You'd eyeball that roof when it was it all measured perfectly. Perfect. But when you stood back and you looked at the back window open, it looked like the header was sunk down a little bit. The rear header. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think it was because the skin got put on a little bit of a skew, so we had to cut the spot welds loose and readjust it. I worked with you and Adam a lot on this one. And if you look at that, remember now, when that thing caught on fire and they went in there to put it out, they jumped up and down on the roof of these cars. So that was all caved in. They don't make the reinforcement, so we had to straighten it. Remember those hours of straightening? Oh, yeah. But that's why I was such a pain in the ass about making sure that that header was right on the money before you drop that skin on. Because right now, you would never know that car was damaged. You look at that car right now from where it started, and you would, you would say somebody cut the numbers out of a car and put it in another one. Oh, yeah. That, you understand that's our job to make it look like that? Oh, yeah. You get that? 100%. Okay. So this car is no different from the standpoint of our quality. We want this quality on all of our cars, whether it was a 340 three-speed convertible, which we done, uh, or, or a tribute car. I want it to be the same quality standards. But in fairness to anybody watching, this is a very likely half a million dollar car or more when it's finished. People are gonna look a lot more closely and with more scrutiny than they would a 318 car that we put a 440 in. This door opening actually looks better than the other door opening. Needs just a little bit of a grind right there. You see that? How that's sticking past it, I'll put a mark on it. Yes, I do. Door fits the rocker nice. Beautiful reveal down the side. This fender has the exact same problem the other one does. So you want me to do the same thing that I'm doing gonna do over just there? Just a little mi yep, just a little minor grinding on the fender and the door at the bottom to make sure that the reveal is the two paint stick thickness all the way up and down. Okay. Before it goes into mud. But the style line down the side is right, so you don't have to go up and down with anything. So let's go look at the the driver's side door. When you have an original piece in the car from the factory, you're able to know that that's where it should be in space. As long as you've seen that nowhere on the car has any damage, like it got took a hit or anything, you know that you can take a measurement that it's gonna be accurate. So having an original part there is so much easier than having something that was cut apart by somebody else that you don't know if it's right. I didn't get a chance to see everything. 
Make sure that door clears, it looks good. Boy, that looks nice. Look at how nice that looks. Turned out beautifully. Here's all, look at the size of these factory spot welds where they weld the tor torsion bar cross member to the floor pan. That is crazy. I mean, that's a half inch if it's anything. Yeah. We're gonna have to talk to our friends over at uh, AIM and see if they make a bigger tip. It'd be kind of fun to duplicate those. Yeah, the cars are strong enough, but it'd be cool if they looked the same. All factory spot welds, just, this is a beautiful, you should take, you should wipe this down and take pictures with your phone and use it every time you're wondering if something will fly, come up to Mark and say, hey, will this fly? I don't know. If it looks like this, it'll always fly. See, Good idea. That's the area over there that was all caved in and down. And it's, and while right now it's not beautiful because there's a lot of damaged metal, they don't make that part. So you either get another used one, which we actually bought an entire part, parts car to get that piece for. And then that piece had rust, so we had to do a bunch of patches to it. But if you look at it, we've got the beautiful reveal across between the header and the roof, all the way down the side. And that was my biggest concern was that upper body. Turned out beautiful. Absolutely perfect. Last thing to notice is look at the reveal of the door to quarter, door to rocker, pinch weld, door to A pillar. Nice work. Thank you. I appreciate that. A lot of cheating goes on to make panels fit, but it looks to me like you followed the rule, which is center that door up and down, forward and backwards, and make everything else fit. To know that it's there when they're after you and they got you in the crosshairs. And it fits like that. Priceless. So this bar right here, this is the side intrusion bar. 70 was the first year for it. Oh, really? They did not have it in 69, yep. And remember in 71, they started putting crush zones in the hood. Well, actually mid-year 1970 on production models started getting crush zones in the hood. This is another attempt at safety. And the other thing the CUDA was proud of was that rear header mm -hmm. and that setup that we were just complaining about. They were calling that a built-in roll bar. <laughs> That's crazy. I wouldn't want to put my noggin underneath that built-in roll bar. <laughs> no. Well, one of the most anticipated reveals in Graveyard Cars history um, was the Phantom Cuda. Happened to be a 71 446 barrel four-speed trackback 354 uh, Tour Red Car EV2. Um, that was a hugely anticipated build because they, typically speaking, we were told we, it couldn't be done. It couldn't be done, you can't do it. So when we revealed that, that turned everything upside down. I would have to say that the Phoenix Cuda reveal will be right in that same family. Most people wouldn't have touched the car. I talked to a couple of restoration guys in the country that do top work, they wouldn't have done it. Don't have the means or the ability or the to have done. It. Okay, I think you're ready to roll it back down there. Just go ahead and finish the rest of those little things. Let Mud know that it's gonna be coming over probably next week. Okay, thank you again, sir. Now I know you're curious. Are you curious about anything I should know about? No. I had questions, not curious. Okay. Questions. I apologize. Had the wrong, uh, wrong verbiage there. Yeah. All right, Georgie, you're doing great, buddy. Thank you. Thanks. Curious.